My mother and I moved towns just before I started Year 11. So I found myself in a new school where the English teacher, the formidable Ms Mason, chose the first week of term uh, to assess whether the new kids were any good at public speaking. Now if, if you've only known me recently you might think that would not be a problem but you need to understand um, that I had absolutely no idea how to speak in public at that point. My previous school, Gunnedah High, had made exactly zero effort to teach public speaking skills and I had made no zero effort to learn them. Um, the one thing the school had done uh, towards that part of the curriculum, and I think this was in year nine, uh, was to make each of us stand up in the school hall in front of the whole year group and give a speech like, with absolutely no training or preparation or support. And on that one occasion, my best friend and I had hidden underneath uh, the benches in a science lab until it was all over. And as I recall, we were not even missed. Um, I realize now it wasn't actually that I was scared of public speaking. I was terrified of utterly humiliating myself in front of my peers and I suspect every teenager ever, in fact every human ever, shares that fear. The point is that I had managed to completely avoid public speaking until that day at the start of year 11 in front of a group of kids who I really wanted to like me um, at this new school. Now, and Ms Mason was not a teacher to be put off by hiding or feigning illness or bursting into tears. She was immovable. So there I was in a new school having to give the first speech of my teenage life and I knew what it was I had to talk about. Now, I'd been a follower of Jesus all my life, and as a teenager, I was filled with a sense of urgency about convincing everyone I knew to follow Jesus. I was that kid who would go to school with a bag full of Christian um, tracts, that's little mini books um, about the gospel, and I would give them to anyone who made the mistake of making eye contact and uh, would take every opportunity uh, to turn my classes into debates on, say, creation or resurrection or morality. So that's the sort of kid I was. And there I was, um, as far as I knew, this is the only opportunity I would ever have to stand up in front of a group of people and preach the gospel. So I had to convince all of my fellow students to become Christians that day because their eternal destiny depended on this five minutes. And I did not know the first thing about public speaking and I was terrified. So I tried to prepare. But I was so nervous and I just couldn't get anything down. And the day approached and I had nothing. Just a few jumbled notes. But I knew my Bible. I remembered Luke 21, 14 to 15. Make up your minds not to prepare your defence in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. So I got up in front of the class, standing on the promises of Scripture, and... I froze. The next five minutes of my life is best left under a shroud of history. Now, I'm sure I am not the first or the last to pluck a verse out of this passage and make it all about me without understanding the big picture of what Jesus was saying here without understanding the way these verses fit into this vision of utter devastation. The passage starts with people praising the temple 
isn't it beautiful? And it really was a startlingly beautiful building. But Jesus responds, As for these buildings, you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. In this whole dark, violent chapter in Luke's Gospel, Jesus is explaining how this is going to happen and what's going to happen around it. This, this devastation, this pointing towards events that will take place in the lead up to 70 AD when Jerusalem, from our perspective in history, when Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was flattened. Today, as I record this sermon, it is Remembrance Day. And on this day, we are deeply aware of the multi-generational impact of war, of the impact of all sorts of violent conflict on displaced peoples after wars and reprisals. We think of Jewish descendants of Holocaust survivors. We also think more recently of those in Ukraine, how long those families are going to take to rebuild. We think of Afghanistan. We think of the Uyghurs in China. There's that fear, separation from family, disease, hunger, homelessness, all of those same terrors and traumas were felt by the Jewish people in 70 AD when Jesus' predictions came into violent reality as the Roman Empire crushed those rebellious little Jewish territories. But on top of that, on top of all of that trauma, for them the temple was their sign that God was with them. Jerusalem was the city from which God was thought to rule as king throughout the world. The land under their feet spoke to them of God's ancient promises fulfilled. And they were going to lose all three of those things. The focus of their confidence in God would be gone forever. Their identity as God's people would be shattered. When Christians read this, 1950 so or so years later, we think these words look like a prediction of the end of the world. And to the people who lived through it, that's exactly what it was. It was the end of their world. And Jesus felt the grief and the trauma of this. He felt it because he was a prophet and he could see it coming. And he felt it because he was very soon going to carry all that grief and trauma on the cross. The death of all hope in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD will be focused in on the death of Jesus 40 years earlier. Jesus, like the temple, was the one in whom God could be known. Jesus, like Jerusalem, was the one through whom God's power and authority could be seen. And Jesus, like the land, was the one in whom all God's promises were fulfilled. Jesus summed up temple, Jerusalem and land in one divine human person. And he died a violent death at the hands of human tyranny. And 40 years later, the temple, Jerusalem and the land would suffer a violent death at the hands of those same tyrants. In the body of Jesus, God's presence, God's power and God's promises all died. That was Friday. Then there was Saturday. Then there was Sunday and Jesus was alive again. And not just that, but God's power, presence and promises were now infused 
with resurrection life, with new creation. No longer focused on a particular building, a particular city, a particular region. They were for everybody, everywhere. And that's why the disciples had such a sense of urgency about communicating this message to Jews so that those awful events of 70 AD, when, when they arrived, so that they could be faced with hope. In their urgency to communicate this message of hope, those first apostles encountered conflict. It was difficult to get the message across. And we see this in the book of Acts, which is part two of Luke's story of the church. And that, that conflict, that conflict that they are going to encounter in getting the message across, that is the context in which Jesus told them that he would give them the words to speak. The context of increasing conflict and genuine urgency about getting the message out before Jerusalem fell so that those horrific events would be faced with hope instead of despair. Because the temple will be gone. The temple would be gone, but God's presence could still be known through Jesus. Jerusalem would be gone, but God's power could be still be known through Jesus. And the land could be gone, or at least the people would be gone from the land, but God's promises were still all fulfilled in Jesus. Now that is not to minimise the trauma faced by those people, those Jewish people around 70 AD. And it's not to imply that they were in any way wrong to want to hold on to those things that gave them hope. Those events were so horrific that even now we should grieve with them. But for those who follow Jesus, God's presence, power and promises were now, are now embodied in his indestructible life. No human tyranny can destroy them ever again. No natural disaster, no political regime change, no accident or crime. They cannot be destroyed. I hope that none of us will ever experience anything like that sort of devastation. But I know that life can sometimes bring us through circumstances that shatter our confidence and destroy our hope and our sense of meaning. Perhaps when a series of losses comes one after another to undermine the whole structure of our life. Or perhaps it's not, not us, perhaps it happens to us when we, we look at other people's suffering, perhaps when we stand with a community that has lost everything in a bushfire or a flood. And at that point, when we experience the death of hope, we who follow Jesus will remember that resurrection lies on the other side of that death. Resurrection to an indestructible hope that is focused on Jesus, on what, in whom God's presence, power and promises can never be shaken. So let's go back to my year 11 self, nervously rising to humiliate myself. What did I get wrong and, well, did I get anything right? Well, the sense of urgency I felt does echo the urgency of the passage, but the cause of the urgency was very different. The early apostles knew they had limited time to encourage their fellow Jews to place their hope in Jesus before the things, the other things, the things they had always hoped for would be lost. There was a genuine need to act quickly then. My urgency, on the other hand, stemmed from thinking that the eternal destiny of all my classmates was my responsibility. That was not so accurate. 
and the potential criticism of my peers was definitely not worth comparing with the genuine risk to life that the early Christians faced. Christians today can sometimes throw around the word persecution a bit too eagerly. But Australian Christians have never been dragged into prison or forced to give an account of their faith before the courts as we see happening in the early church. What I did get right, I think, in amongst all the fears and misunderstandings of my adolescent zeal was the hope was that the hope we have in Jesus is to be shared. It is to be talked about. Not, not out of fear for what might happen if we don't, but out of love. Because if, if the hope that we have in Christ has sustained us through difficult times, if the love of Christ has helped us to see ourselves as worthy to contribute to our community, if the presence of Christ has given us strength to do hard things, then don't we want the people we love to experience that too? Don't we want that for our family, for our neighbours, for our workmates? Of course. We will present that message with more tact than I employed as a teenager. We will listen first, and we will listen second, and we will pray third, and we will speak fourth. And we will communicate our living hope through our actions even more than our words. But when we have an opportunity, we will speak. And we will ask God to speak through us. So the message of hope will do more than our words alone could possibly do. That it will soften hearts, change minds and lives, and transform the death of hope into the resurrection of life. Amen.